Okay, so um, yeah, in summary, we'll we'll have a look at reasons for investigating abortions, uh, surveillance results, and then a, a little bit at the end about the investigation itself. And uh, hopefully on the, along the way, there'll be a few interesting facts and dip bits to, to pick up. So we'll start with why, uh, why investigate bovine abortions? So just a reminder of the definition of an abortion first. So it's classed as expulsion of a non-viable fetus, alive or dead, uh, but less than 271 days after the service or insemination. And um, we differentiate that from a stillbirth, uh, which is uh, a fully formed dead uh, fetus or, or one that dies shortly after birth. Uh, expelled at term because we actually investigate those differently and we won't be covering that today. So why do we investigate them? Um, lots of lots of really good reasons for investigating bovine abortion. So there is it's a general uh, indicator of the health and welfare of of the herd. So this might not be a one off event. This might actually be um, a signal that you've got uh, a more general disease, uh, BVD, for instance, perhaps some salmonella. Um, and as such, it could be uh, particularly costly to the farmer. So it's actually really difficult to get a, a an estimate of, of how much abortion costs. And there aren't any, any up-to-date estimates. Um, in the literature, there's sort of 600 for dairy, 800 for a circular. But I think you can probably work out for yourself. It's, it's likely to be significantly more and it's going to depend very much on the circumstances. Um, a lost a lost suckler car, for instance, is, is substantial uh, when that's your um, pretty much your only output from the farm. So. Um, and on the dairy side, of course, uh, you're you're going to lose days in milk with, with an empty with an empty cow. Public health consideration that that's really important, isn't it? So again, salmonellosis is a good example um, among others. Um, so if we were to diagnose salmonella on a farm, then we have to then carry out a risk ass assessment to see whether any, any actions have to be taken to protect public health. So uh, perhaps raw milk is, is drunk on that farm or, or, or there, there are visitors to that farm. Um, so that's one of our roles is, is, is in protecting public health. And then we have a, one really, really important reason. It's the reason we're here doing these subsidised uh, abortions, and that is to meet our international trade agreements. So um, the, the EU is largely free of Bruxelles, and in order to for us to do international trade, we have to do ongoing surveillance, like all the countries um, that we trade with, uh, to prove that we are are free of brucellosis. Now, um, just to, to sort of clarify what we mean by brucellosis, the, the notifiable um, brucella species are uh, brucella abortus, which is the one we, we're primarily testing for in cattle. There's also brucella ovis, melitensis in sheep and goats, and, and, and brucella suis as well. Um, I know there's been a lot in the press about brucella canis. That, that is reportable, um, but it's not treated in the in the same way as as these ones that we're interested in here. So as to say, that affects the whole industry, um, and and is a really really important reason for engaging in this. And it is actually a statutory requirement. So all farmers should well they have to report abortions um, within 24 hours of them happening. Now there's ongoing surveillance anyway on bulk milk, uh, but. But uh, cows that aren't being surveyed in that way, uh, suckler cows and some other exceptions, for instance, uh, if they were aborted at a show or if they were born outside Britain, um, then they have enhanced surveillance. Uh, the, the farmer should also be isolating the cow and placenta pending um, the outcome of a risk assessment and whether uh, we decide to go and do this additional testing. OK, so that aside, um, it's perhaps not financially viable to investigate every single abortion uh, with the full raft of tests that we do. So as a as a general rule, we say if, it, if the annual instance in the herd exceeds three percent, you should be having a, a look into into some of these. And then if several abortions occur in close succession, what we class as or describe as an abortion storm. Um, then that would certainly uh, 
trigger some investigation. And the other thing is if the cow is clinically ill that, that's aborted. And um, most of the time they're not actually ill, but again, it could be a uh, an indicator of perhaps um, if they're scary, it might be again salmonella, another example for salmonella, or perhaps they've got respiratory signs indicative of a, a, a new IBR infection in the herd. So the, the next section, um, I'm, what I've done is I've taken five years worth of our VIDA data, as uh, Harriet described earlier, we everything uh, that we diagnose gets awarded the code according to strict criteria. So I've gone to the data and I've pulled out all the abortions and uh, what they were diagnosed or not diagnosed as. And I've done a little bit of, um, I've, I've drawn some nice plots for you to have a look at because I, I do find it quite interesting. So we'll start with um, where the data actually comes from. Okay, right. So Two things. One is we do have access to Scottish data. I've removed that from this data set. I think epidemiologically, uh, England and Wales are probably more similar, and there are some differences with Scotland. So uh, I've, I've removed Scotland. And then the other thing you need to know is that we receive two types of submissions. And one is postal submissions, and that might be simply a maternal blood sample. Uh, or it might be a whole raft of, of tissues fixed and fresh. And of course, the other thing is we have the carcass submissions, hopefully with placenta. We always prefer if we can have placenta because that allows us to do the, all the tests and look for certain organisms that we can't uh, without placenta. So the carcasses will either be the farmer, if they're nearby, will drop them off, or if they are eligible for carcass collection, then then uh, we we do we do arrange for that as well. We'll start with our actual numbers. So over five years, as you can see, about twice as many submissions come in by post. A little explanation of the colour coding. So the grey is when we class it as limited testing. So that's where we haven't received the sufficient tissues to do all the, all the tests that are possible to, to reasonably get, get a diagnosis. And um, and then our blue is we have received all those tissues, uh, but we haven't found diagnosis. And then the sort of brownie orange, uh, the brownie red colour is yes, we managed to uh, find an abortion agent that fitted all the criteria for our VIDA code. So yeah, as you can see, it, twice as many submissions by post, but we have about three times as many successful diagnoses when we get the actual carcass. So if we look at that by proportion next, it's often said that abortion diagnosis is quite disappointing, but you can see that 45% of the time we're actually getting a diagnosis when we get the fetus, which I think is pretty good really. Now there's still a little bit of grey when we receive a fetus. That might be, well sometimes it's just too water lies, so we can't sample everything. Um, other times the fetus has been predated perhaps so we can't take all our preferential samples we can perhaps test the brain stem or something like that um, or maybe take a swab from the lungs but we can't do the full raft of tests so if you ignore the gray bit really half the time when we have all the tissues uh, available to us and we do we actually get a diagnosis but why don't we get a diagnosis sometimes so we can think of abortions, broadly speaking, as infectious and non-infectious. Now our surveillance, um, the submissions we get are, are somewhat biased. I mean, that's not a bad thing, um, but they are biased towards infectious causes. And that tends to be because most of our submissions will be when you get a lot of abortions in one go. And that does tend to be caused by viral, um, an, uh, an infectious cause. And that may be bacterial, viral, protozoal or fungal, or actually any inflammatory process um, that it perhaps causes um, pyrexia sufficient enough to, to cause luteolysis and loss of the pregnancy. Then we have non-infectious causes. That, now they're a lot harder to diagnose because you, you don't necessarily find gross or, or laboratory features uh, to diagnose these. So these may be physical, perhaps the, the cows have been stressed, 
perhaps there's heat stress or they've been handled, um, moved around, uh, perhaps not in the ideal manner. Uh, it could be a, a nutritional problem, a toxic, there may be a genetic problem. Now, as I say, they're difficult to diagnose. That's not to say if we have a, a whole load of abortions from a farm and we don't find anything that we're, we're just going to give up. I think in those circumstances, this is one of these flags for our, our surveillance. We are looking for novel diseases, more unusual patterns. We might suggest in that case that we come and do a farm visit, for instance. So, so we, we, don't, we wouldn't necessarily just give up on these. Um, we're certainly making a note and keeping an eye on these. Right, let's move on to the actual causes. So I have... I have lined up all the, the years one by one. Really, the point to make is that there isn't a lot of yearly uh, variation. You, you broadly get the same pattern year on year. Um, what you can see there is that Neospora and Salmonella are, are accounting for around about 40% of all the diagnoses we make. So what I've done here, is I've removed the diagnosis, diagnosis not achieved. That, that's sort of 50 odd percent. And uh, the little grey bit at the top is where we did make a diagnosis, but it's not one of our standard causes of abortion. So that's the overall picture. Uh, let's have a little look. Now, um, risk factors are different in milk, uh, dairy herds and suckler herds. Here are the number of submissions from the two herd purposes, and you can see a lot more of ours are, are dairy than suckler, more than twice as many. And if we then look at that by proportion, there are differences. So uh, you'll see here that salmonella accounts for very little of the diagnosis we make in suckler herds. Uh, some of them remain about the same. Um, and what I've done in the next slide actually is is put the top five to make it a little bit easier to appreciate. So as you can see, some, something like True Perella, um, which we is a bit of an opportunist. It, it sort of spreads from usually in some other source of of the bacteria internally in the cow. It's about the same in between dairy and suckler. But as you can see, Salmonella is a quarter of the diagnosis we make in dairy herds are are, are due to Salmonella Dublin. Um, slightly more near Spora as well. Whereas on uh, in the suckler herds, bacillus is right there at the top, and fungi also feature in the top five. BVD about the same. Disappointing given the efforts we've made in in recent years on on BVD eradication. We've still got a long way to go there. But I'd like you to think about why this is. What are these risk factors? Because that sort of gets your brain uh, ticking when you you're going out and taking your history for an investigation. Why might salmonella be so so common in dairy herds? And not seen in beef herds. What about bacillus? Why is that so common um, in beef herds? It's a soil organism that's that's sporophorine, so that that might give you a clue. We'll perhaps have a little discussion at the end about that if if you feel like it, but I'll leave you to think about it. Um, looking at the diagnosis by month might give us a bit of a clue as to risk factors for these uh, causes of abortion. So neospora, I think we can say there isn't really a seasonal pattern in, in the spora diagnoses. But here's a uh, diagnosis of fungal abortion by, by month, just for a contrast. And as you can see, this is a real winter problem. It's worth remembering that, that uh, a fungus, although we perhaps associated it with a, being a bit of an opportunist, if you have uh, some bedding or some poor quality, poor, poorly stored forage that's full of fungal spores, you can get an abortion outbreak. And this is this is what we're seeing here. So for the last little bit, then we'll just just have a quick run through which samples to take and how to investigate. So as ever. As, as it is for any situation, history is so important. And here's, here's a few ideas of, of the information to collect. So as we've already dis just discussed, the purpose of the herd is really important. The risk factors are clearly different in dairy herds from suckler herds. We want to know the number of abortions. Is it exceeding our expectations? 2% is probably acceptable, but some farmers report 
really no abortions. And what's the timeline? Are we dealing with an abortion storm? What stage of gestation did the abortions occur? Some of, some causes of abortion tend to occur later in late gestation. Some, such as Neospora, would peak in the, in the second trimester or slightly later. And then there's the age of dams. Is this in first calving heifers, you know, naive cows? Or is it really not, is there no pattern whatsoever? Is it affecting all cows? Is this, is, is this a new infectious agent to which the, the herd is naive and, it, and it's, it's not really got any age pattern whatsoever? Are there any other clinical signs? Once again, I think some is a good example because quite often we do see scour and sickness in the cows as well, though not necessarily so. Has there been any change in management? Has the diet changed? Have we got access to that that uh, um, poorly conserved forage or, or a new delivery of, of straw with mould in it or anything like that? Have there been an introduction of uh, perhaps some young dogs that weren't on the farm before and they've got access to carving pens? And, and that really brings us quite nicely onto biosecurity. Do wild animals and birds have access to the, the TMR, for instance? And of course, vaccination status, given that some of these diseases, BVD, IBR, salmonella, are preventable. OK. Now, tissue samples themselves, I've put in green the ones that we routinely, well, we, we to be fair, when, when the carcass comes in, we, we collect all of these things, uh, with the exception of maternal clotted blood, obviously. Um, but the green ones are the ones that are definitely priority when you're perhaps sending samples in. And sometimes it's not possible to organise carcass collection, but we do have a, a fee that we will sometimes uh, test all, all these samples under for you. So it's much like uh, submitting the carcass itself. So once again, placenta, really important. And we use that for looking for some of the more nasty zoonotic diseases, such as uh, the brucellosis, of course, chlamydophila, which does occur in cows as well occasionally, and Q fever. Uh, fetal stomach contents. Now that is so important because that's where a lot of our bacterial uh, abortion agents, that's how we diagnose those, but simply by growing them from fetal stomach contents. And, and as we saw in the the plots of all the breakdown of, of agents, that, that bacteria feature quite quite prominently. Uh, we also use that to look for fungal infections. If we don't have fetal stomach contents, we don't always. Uh, we take a swab of the liver or lung. We use brainstem for viral PCRs. So, that, so that's primarily Neospora and Schmallenberg as well sometimes. And then spleen for some of the other viral PCRs, such as BVD. Occasionally, we also uh, ask Q fever on that. Fetal fluid can be used for fetal serology. And then we tend to keep some other bit fresh, fresh tissues. Kidney could be used for leptospirosis, although we, we don't routinely test for that. Um, and then fixed tissues, we sometimes, if, if we're unable to get a diagnosis, we can, we can go to our fixed tissues. Uh, if the fetus is heavily autolyzed, then it's it's not worth keeping these because they're not they're not of any diagnostic use. Maternal clotted blood can be useful. It really depends on the history. Um, so that's something to chat over with your VIO if you're considering that. Obviously, if they're vaccinated, then it's not going to be very much use. Um, now, we've got a, hand, uh, a handout went out with the uh, invite to the meet the link to the meeting, I believe. So we've got these pictures reproduced on the handout just as a reference. But this is just a, a quick guide on the best way to take the actual samples. So we look, if you're submitting them by post and you're sending placenta, you don't have to send the whole thing, but do make sure there's a cotyledon and a bit of intercotyledon in the placenta. Fetal stomach contents does need to be collected in an aseptic way, which means searing the surface of the stomach. Uh, now, we would do that with uh, a knife and a blowtorch. You might have access to that or a heat gun. Quite often farmers have, have a heat gun or something similar hanging around on the farm. A lot of people will get by with heating a scalpel blade with a 
cigarette lighter, which, uh, uh, well, you'd need steady hands, I guess, because you've got a small area seared, but uh, it, it's, it's possible if there aren't any alternatives. Often the fetal stomach contest is really thick and the vacutaneous doesn't work. So you could just use a syringe and 12 gauge needle um, again through the seared surface. The easiest way to collect brainstem is to have the fetus on its back. And then if you incise ventrodorally, dorsally, just behind the ears and, and bend the head away, and, and then you can cut down into the anterior joint and visualize the brainstem. And you don't need very much, but if you pop that in a in a universal or a bijou pot, we can uh, store that for a PCR. Now, preferably we would have the whole brain, okay, fixed this is. Now, the first thing to say is if you open up the brain and it's looking completely abnormal, we do actually need to report that as a, a suspected blue tongue. So that, so that you would get onto that single point of contact phone line and inform us of that. This is a normal looking brain though. Um, if you haven't opened up the cranium before, I mean, I when I was in practice, I used to carry a junior hacksaw around because I could replace the blade. And depending on the gestation of the calf, that's perfect. you might well if it's it's mid gestation get away with just a sharp knife. But um, if it's a little bit later, then you probably do need a saw of some description. But I do find a, a hacksaw, a steady hand, adequate. So you do this uh, incision across about the level of the lateral campfire and then you join that up to the frame and magnet at the back and then you can gently prise the top of the cranium off with a screwdriver or perhaps um, the other end of your scalpel blade holder and gently tip it out uh, severing the attachments underneath. Now um, sometimes if it, it is heavily autolyzed then it, it's too liquid to do that so so it's not worth keeping. I remember to fix an inadequate amount of, of formalin. So uh, that in re realistically, that does mean a bio bottle if you're carrying this around in your car, because you want something screw top so it doesn't leak. A quick note on BS7 before I wrap this up. Uh, now you will need the statutory surveillance panel. Uh, so those of you who are not yet in practice, you you may or may not get trained up and given this panel as an official veterinarian, but you will need that to go and do this testing. And when you do that, you will go and collect a maternal body blood, a vaginal swab, and a composite milk sample. And then if it's available, placenta and the fetus, there isn't always a fetus available. Milk is a bit tricky, uh, I understand that, having done this in practice. Suckler cows not used to being milked and they don't necessarily have any milk anyway, depending on which stage of gestation they're in. So be be very careful and risk assess the situation. And make sure that paperwork is completed and that the farmer knows um, that this the cow needs to be isolated until the results come back. So I did allude at the start to, to the fact that we investigate stillbirth investigations and I think perhaps another time we'll we'll cover stillbirths instead of abortions. It does vary because there's a lot more emphasis on the non-infectious causes as well as the infectious causes. So it does inv involve additional examinations for subtle changes and other tests. And that is that. So I'd like to thank contributors. I, I did burrow or steal a lot of material from uh, Rachel Collins and um, Caroline's video, of course. And I've been given data by Anna and a picture by Toby as well. So I'll leave it with some links to say, I think I'll pop these into the chat for everyone so they can access them whenever they want. If that's OK, I think I'm done there, Harriet. Thank you so much for that, Liz. That was really interesting.